You have your hard-earned money at Schwab, Fidelity, or Vanguard. Maybe even your life savings. But is that money really safe if your broker were to run into trouble? That's what we'll be talking about in today's video. Hello, member super savers and bond course fans. I hope you're having a good week. So we've been receiving a lot of emails like this one here recently. I just watched the Schwab video and I have a question I hope you can help with. I have around $4 million as Schwab. Is it safe? Should I move it someplace else? First, a big congratulations to the super saver who sent this email because $4 million is a nice amount of money to have with your broker. Second, it doesn't matter if you have $4 million, $40 million, or $4,000 in your brokerage account. It's always your hard-earned money. So I think it's important for you, for all of us, to understand how that money is protected with our brokerage company, whether it's safe if your broker was to run into trouble. Third, while I will be using mainly Schwab, Fidelity, and Vanguard as examples in this video, because these are the three platforms that our Diamond Nestic community use most frequently, what we will be discussing mostly applies to Merrill Edge, E-Trade, and all other SIPC member brokerage firms as well. And yes, all registered brokers and dealers are SIPC members by law, with some exceptions. If you're with a smaller broker and want to confirm whether your broker actually is an SIPC member, I've included the link to this SIPC list of members page in the first pinned comment below this video for you. So here are the three topics that we'll be covering in today's video. How does SIPC coverage actually keep your money safe at Schwab, Fidelity, Vanguard, and other brokerage firms? When does excess of SIPC coverage come into play? And how much is it at Schwab, Fidelity, Vanguard, E-Trade, and Merrill Edge? And what other factors might you also want to consider? As usual, here's a front of video disclaimer. For a detailed disclaimer, please refer to the end of this video. Let's dive in now, folks. Let's cover some basics first. SIPC stands for Securities Investor Protection Corporation. SIPC protects against the loss of cash and securities, such as stocks and bonds, held by a customer at a financially troubled SIPC member brokerage firm. Here is a more detailed list of what SIPC considers as securities. And yes, it includes treasuries, CDs, mutual funds, money market funds, and so on. I've linked this page in the first pinned comment as well, if you want more details. Now, this loss of cash and securities here that the SIPC protects against, it does not refer to the loss in market value of your stocks and bonds, meaning SIPC does not protect you against the investment risk that you take when you buy a security. In other words, it does not make you whole if the price of your stocks and bonds goes down. Rather, this loss here refers to the scenario where your cash and securities are actually physically lost or missing from your brokerage account, meaning that SIPC protection only kicks in when your SIPC member broker is in financial trouble and your cash and securities are nowhere to be found with your broker due to theft, fraud, or other reasons. More on this later in the video. When SIPC protection kicks in, the SIPC limit is $500,000 per account, which includes a limit of $250,000 for cash. If you have multiple accounts with the same broker, then SIPC protection of customers with multiple accounts is determined by separate capacity. Each separate capacity is protected up to $500,000 for securities and cash, including a $250,000 limit for cash only. Here are some examples of separate capacities. So if I have a brokerage account, a traditional IRA, and a Roth IRA at Fidelity, I'm covered by SIPC up to $500,000 in each of these accounts, including a $250,000 limit for cash only in each of these accounts. And yes, that means that taken together, 
my holdings with fidelity across these three capacities, they would be SIPC protected for a theoretical total of $1.5 million. That's three times 500,000, of which up to $750,000, three times 250,000 would be for cash. However, please do note that you need to make sure your assets are well distributed. You cannot carry over an unused part of your protection from one account into another. As usual, let's walk through a hypothetical situation to make sure everything is clear. Let's assume that in my Fidelity brokerage account, I have T-bills of 100,000, Amazon stock of 100,000, SPAC shares of 50,000, SPACs is Fidelity's money market fund that many of the Fidelity fans in our diamond nested community have their excess cash automatically swept into. And in addition, I have cash of $250,000, bringing me to a total account value of $500,000. So I'm just within the SIPC coverage threshold. And let's further assume for illustrative purposes only that Fidelity collapses and for whatever reason, there is nothing left in my Fidelity account. My T-bills, Amazon stock, SPACs, and cash have all gone missing somehow. In this hypothetical situation, SIPC would cover me and make me whole via a replacement of in-kind securities or return of cash for my physically lost T-bills Amazon stock, SPAC shares, and cash. In essence, this means that the SIPC can give me new T-bills, Amazon stock, and SPAC shares to replace my missing securities and pay out the protected cash. Plus, any remaining protected securities that they can't replace in kind, they can also give it back to me in cash. If you need more information on how this replacement would work in real life, and how these separate capacities can help increase your SIPC threshold with your broker, then please do refer to this detailed SIPC video here, linked in the first pinned comment below. But here's the piece about broker safety and SIPC protection that often gets confusing and sometimes misunderstood. Both of these events have to happen for SIPC protection to kick in and cover our loss. And under normal circumstances, even if Fidelity, Schwab, Vanguard, or any other brokerage firm were to collapse, the stocks, bonds, and or cash that belong to me should still be in my brokerage account. They should not be physically gone unless there is some sort of broker theft, fraud, etc. Because as many of you know, Client assets need to be kept separate in segregated accounts that would not be affected by the bankruptcy of the broker. More on this as well very soon. It's also important to understand that brokerage, just like banking and advisory, is a highly regulated industry. And SIPC is just one of the ways that we are protected as brokerage customers. There are many other ways that we're protected as brokerage customers. For example, there are certain very strict rules and regulations that brokerage firms have to follow to minimize their chances of getting into financial trouble, meaning to minimize the chances of even ever getting to this point of bankruptcy in our hypothetical illustration here in the first place. Here are some key rules and regulations that brokerage firms have to follow. The first one we already discussed. Brokerage firms generally must become an SIPC member, meaning they have to pay into the SIPC fund and offer their customers SIPC protection. The second is SEC Rule 15C3-1, the net capital rule. It requires brokerage firms to maintain certain levels of their own liquid assets, depending on their size and business. The third is SEC Rule 15C3-3. The customer protection rule requires that brokerage firms which have custody of customer assets, for example, Fidelity, Vanguard, and Schwab, they have to keep those assets separate from their own accounts, those segregated client accounts I mentioned before.
According to FINRA, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, another head honcho of the U.S. financial services regulatory industry, customers' cash must be placed in a special separate reserve account, and fully paid customer securities must be kept separate from firm and customer margin securities. The fourth is that brokerage firms typically need to have their financial statements audited by an independent accounting firm annually and filed on a regular basis with the SEC. And the fifth is that FINRA and the SEC monitor and supervise broker compliance on an ongoing basis and closely communicate issues with one another and the SIPC when they arise. And when something goes very wrong, here's what typically happens. If FINRA discovers that a broker has financial problems, it reports that to the SEC and vice versa. And if it appears that customer securities and or cash may be missing, they report this to the SIPC for further action. So yes, SIPC does protect us in the event that our broker collapses and the securities and or cash are missing from our brokerage. Again, both of these things have to happen for SIPC to kick in. But even before the SIPC steps in, there are other regulatory bodies and safeguards in place to minimize the chances of our broker getting to this point of financial problem. All this is to say that even if your broker does not blow you away with their business strategy or bank sweep rates, or perhaps their customer service or trading and research platform, FINRA, the SEC, and SIPC are there to keep the money in our brokerage accounts as safe as it possibly can be up to these SIPC thresholds. Which brings us nicely back to this question from the beginning of our video. I have around $4 million at Schwab. Is it safe? Should I move it someplace else? And the next section of today's video. Excess of SIPC coverage essentially comes into play in the worst case scenario, when your broker manages to sidestep FINRA, the SEC, and their regulatory and compliance safeguards, your broker fails and goes into liquidation under SIPC, and your securities and or cash are missing from your brokerage account due to broker theft, fraud, or some other reason, and you're above the SIPC protection limits of $500,000, including up to a limit of $250,000 for cash per account, per the SIPC's separate capacity definition. So. All of this here has to happen for excess of SIPC coverage to even come into play. Excess of SIPC insurance is provided by a private insurer, not by the SIPC, and as we understand, is typically purchased at the discretion of the brokerage company. There is no legal obligation to provide excess of SIPC insurance, although most major brokers do so. It's also intended to be used only when the standard SIPC coverage threshold is exhausted. This table shows the excess of SIPC coverage for the leading brokerage companies. Let's start with the brokers who have the most first. Fidelity, Merrill Edge, and E-Trade have aggregate excess of SIPC coverage of $1 billion, meaning that's the total amount, the most, that their excess of SIPC insurance covers for all their clients combined. There's generally no per customer dollar limit on coverage of securities for these three firms, but there is a per customer limit of $1.9 million on coverage of cash awaiting investment. It seems $1 billion is the maximum excess SIPC protection currently available from Lloyd's of London, the insurer that all three of these firms use for excess of SIPC coverage. Schwab has an aggregate excess of SIPC coverage of $600 million, limited to a combined return of $150 million per customer, up to $1.15 million of which may be in cash. Schwab is also insured through Lloyds of London and other London insurers. 
And finally, Vanguard has an aggregate excess of SIPC coverage of $250 million for all claims of missing securities. There is a per client limit of $49.5 million for missing securities and $1.9 million for missing cash. Vanguard does not disclose too much detail online, so we actually had to call in to get these numbers again. And just so you know, these were the exact same numbers that they gave us when we called in 2023. Tanya, the Vanguard rep we spoke to this time, said that she wasn't sure which insurer Vanguard used to provide this excess of SIPC coverage. Now, if we look at these numbers for excess of SIPC coverage here, I'm sure some of you may be thinking, that's not a lot when some of these firms, namely Fidelity, Schwab, and Vanguard, have trillions of assets under management. But keep in mind, excess of SIPC coverage only comes into play in the worst case scenario, when all of these things happen together, which if you ask me, is not very likely if you're with one of the leading brokers like Schwab, Fidelity, Vanguard, E-Trade, or Merrill Edge. Now, the SIPC does publish numbers about how many investor claims exceeded the insurance limits and remained unsatisfied, were not made whole basically, in all of its liquidation procedures. As you can see here, only 355 claims, less than 1% of the total, fall into this category. And only claims in the amount of $49.7 million, again, less than 1% of the value distributed to customers, remained unsatisfied, meaning that even the $250 million excess of SIPC coverage that Vanguard offers would have easily been sufficient to pay off all these excess claims for all SIPC proceedings. It appears to me that if worse came to worse, the average customer at any of these leading brokerage companies should be pretty much covered when you combine the SIPC's coverage limit with the excess of SIPC coverage limits. So hopefully this will give you some peace of mind. And on that note, let's move on now to the next section of this video. As many of our diamond nest egg regulars know, I'm a conservative super saver at heart. So to help me sleep a bit better at night, my preference with my money is not to keep all my eggs in one basket, which means keeping each of my accounts based on the SIPC's separate capacity below the SIPC protection limits. And it also means using more than one broker, although our primary broker is still Fidelity, and I don't see that changing anytime soon at the moment. But as I always say, everyone's financial journey is different. If you have $4 million at Schwab like this super saver does, or even if you have $40 million at Fidelity, Vanguard, E-Trade, or Merrill Edge, if you can sleep well at night with the amount that you have with one broker, based on what you've learned in this video about all the regulatory safeguards in place, plus your broker's excess of SIPC coverage, then you may come to a different conclusion about keeping all your eggs in one basket than we have. The other important factor to note, because this question almost always comes up when we talk about SIPC limits, is that while SIPC coverage does apply to traditional IRAs and Roth IRAs, it is not available separately for the individual participants in a 401k plan. These have some separate safeguards under ERISA, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. You can learn more about ERISA and your 401k in this video here, also linked in the first pinned comment below. So, I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new. And if you did, and actually came here to learn more about fixed income, then I invite you to take a look at this video here on our 2024 bond courses, where I teach you the easiest, safest, and most cost-effective way to start with bond investing while rates are attractive. Or join our next live member Q&A in August, where we'll be continuing our conversations on all things fixed income. Check out the links below this video for more details on our bond courses and YouTube Super Super Saver membership.
All right, members, Super Savers, and Barn Course fans, wishing you a wonderful rest of the week and see you again very soon with more brand new wealth building content for your financial journey.